It's not every day I get to uh, approach with this much time, but uh, today I really felt this was an agenda of heaven. Sometimes the agenda is just to uh, continue worship and and just encourage that way. Sometimes the agenda is just to, uh, you know, right after the first couple songs, that's that gets people excited. You flow with it and move with it. But, but other time, the agenda is get to the bread of life and, uh, and just get right to it. Amen. <clears throat> I've, um, I've had the privilege, as you know it, and, and several here has been with me over the last several years, but I've had the privilege to travel globally and, uh, I, I do my best in talking with people and staying in touch with people to keep the temperature of the body of Christ and what goes on in the body of Christ and, and uh, where people are at, what they're strong, you know, where it seems like God's moving and where people are struggling at. And uh, there are some things that God has really dealt with my heart when it comes to not only Covenant of Peace Church, but the body of Christ. In the last days in the last days that we must strengthen the weak, strengthen the weak and stop coddling the weak. There's two different things. You strengthen them through the word of God and being, and being, uh, being forthright with the word. Whatever you put into people, that's what they become. If we coddle and make excuses for our weaknesses, we stay weak. If somebody coddles us and always makes excuses, that's why we stay weak. That's, that's you know, the generations that we come from uh, in Little League. Uh, of course, I didn't get to play a whole lot of it, uh, you know, around, but I did play Little League and did different things. Uh, the winner's winner. The, the, the winner's won and the loser's lost. Everybody didn't get a trophy. Everybody didn't get a coin. Everybody didn't get a, uh, uh, you know, a thing to hang around their neck. If you won, you won. If you lost, you lost. You cried if you lost, but then you realized that if I didn't want to cry, I tried to win. And the whole thing is the same way spiritually, that the day that we're in, you just got to determine that I'm going to, I'm going to win because there's one winners and there's a loser and you can't afford to lose in these last days. You can't afford to lose in these last days. And so God created us to be winners and not losers. So you, you can't expect for, for everything to just, just go your way. Until Burger King starts opening services on Sunday morning, you can't have it your way. You can't do it unless Burger King starts having church next Sunday morning. You can't go in there and just have it your way. And you can't have it my way. If everything was my way, it'd look a whole lot different than what it is. People look different than what they are. But it's not my way. It's God's way. I got to abide by God's way. I, I don't bring the word down for me. That's why I still repent. That's why I still apologize. That's why I still do what I do. Because I'm not allowed to even change it for me. I can't do it. It has to be what it is. It has to be what it is. And um, there's some things that goes on. Uh, there's a verse that I, that I want to read today. And I want you, before I get to my sermon, if I get to it, you better count one of this. Um, I want you to go with me to Luke. Uh, Luke 22. Yeah. Luke 22. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Was, was Peter convinced he would, he would not deny God? He did. He was convinced, wasn't he? He was convinced. He was convinced. Here's a verse that's in my heart. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Verse 31. Simon, Simon. Indeed. Indeed, Satan has asked for you or desired you. Satan has desired you. 
that he may sift you as wheat. Now there's a sifting going to take place. There's a sifting that's going to take place. Satan desires to have you to sift you. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, I like that. When you have returned to me, it's the other one. uh, uh, One says when you are converted, when you have returned to me, when you are converted. I, I like the word return to me. Because it's, a, it's all about, we use words like converted and people don't understand converted, but we, under, we must understand when you return to him, spirit, soul, and body, when you return to him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, when you return to him without conditions that, you know, I'll serve you if you do this, there's none of this making deals with God. God already made a deal for you through Jesus Christ. He already cut the deal for you through Jesus We don't go around trying to broker another deal with God. The deal's already been brokered. When you return to me, that your face fail not. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. So until you get right, you can't go and help other people. Until you get strength in yourself, you can't go help other people. You can shout, you can speak in tongues, but the truth is you're not going to be help, you're not going to be able to help people until you're able to be strong yourself. These last days are going to get very interesting if you haven't already t- if you haven't already tell. And you got you you can't continue to make excuses for your flesh. You can't continue to make excuses for your flesh. You you can come up with your own doctrine if you want to, but the Bible's very clear what sin is and what life is. You can't continue to try to justify and think, well, you know, God understands me. I'm nothing but flesh. Well, nothing but flesh will still burn in hell. It's a very simple process. It's a very simple process. God understands I'm flesh. Yes, he does. But he understands that he gave you a way to live victorious. He gave you a way to live victorious. Someone said to me one day, well, you know, you're preaching to the choir. You know how many people in a choir sin, commit adultery, and and run around on God? Just because you're in a choir doesn't mean you don't need to hear truth. So forget the thing you're preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to fallible people. I'm preaching to people that's got to get up. You got to walk with God. You got to live straight. And you got to walk under the covenant that God has has placed before you and just carrying the title of Christian is not going to keep you safe in these last days. Walking with God under the covenant power of Jesus Christ is what's going to keep you safe in the last days. Amen. 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 So there's, there's uh, one, two, three, four, four words. They all begin with P that I want to just hit real quick. They all begin with P. Number one, if you're going to survive in these last days, you got to be persistent. Persistent. You have got to be persistent. I see that all the way from the book of Nehemiah that the book just, you know, changed my heart one day when I read it. He was persistent. You, you, you can't just, you can't be persistent one day and, and, uh, and, and to be folly the next. You've got to stay persistent. You've got to be persistent. You, if somebody wants to, it's amazing. Let me start it this way. It's amazing when people want to prove their point, how persistent they are. If they want to exercise their flesh, how persistent they are. You've got to be persistent in the things of God. You've got to be persistent in the things of God. And uh, if you're not persistent, the enemy's going to win. If, if you're not persistent, the enemy will win. You've got to make sure that, that you are persistent. And that next word I want to I want to look at, uh, that, that you've got to know how to persevere. That means when times are tough, you don't stop. You don't stop. Persistent, perseverance, you don't stop. You have got to make sure you stay in that area. Uh, you know, we've all gone through things, but you don't know what I've gone through, but you don't know what I've gone through. We've all gone through things, but the truth is you got to go through it. You can't just hang out and then 30 years later keep making excuses because you got hurt. You got to go through it. 
I've had people say, you know, uh, this way before pastor and I'd be out traveling, you know, preaching and, and, uh, people would want to come and talk to you, uh, because the pastor don't understand them. So when the guest speaker comes in, they want to come and talk to the guest speaker. Uh, you know, and, uh, I've had people meet me at the back door and said, uh, here, I didn't want to put this in the offering. Uh, I wanted to give it directly to you. Well, I took it right to the pastor. I never played that money game. I took it right to the pastor. I've never allowed money to corrupt me. Took it right to the pastor. You know why they give it to me? Because, because they got an offense towards the church and they don't want the money to go to the church. And the, or, or some of them just wanted me to know exactly it was me that, that, uh, that they were given that much to. I just gave it to the church. I didn't keep it. I'm not going to allow people to play ends against the middle. So I just gave back to the church. But I could always tell when people starts off, well, the pastor don't understand, so I need to talk to you. I need to talk to somebody. And, uh, you know, I've just been going through so many things. How long have you been going through it? For the last 15 years. You're not going through it, my brother. You're camping there. You, you've done put up a mailbox. All mail come here. No, if you're going through something, you're going through it. See, there's a, there's a word that we have to understand that uh, faith and patience. There's another P. Patience. Say patience. patience. Well, patience isn't just, you know, putting up with it. Patience is another part of this perseverance that you're going to persevere and be patient with. That that means you're going to act the same, walk the same, talk the same, regardless of what goes on around you. The Bible says through faith and patience, they inherit the kingdom. It didn't say just through faith, they inherited the kingdom. Well, I got strong faith. I don't guarantee you're going to inherit the kingdom. It says through faith and patience, they inherited the kingdom. That means they were able to be possessors of the things that God gave them or God that God proclaimed in their life. They were possessors of it through faith and patience. Now, I've used this example ever since I began preaching faith here, and that is faith is what comes out of our heart. Faith is more than words. Faith is, faith is believing. Faith is speaking. Faith is believing. Faith is acting. Faith has three parts. If your faith is only about speaking, you're still going to live defeated. If your faith is only about, I believe, I believe, you'll still be defeated until you act on it. You've got to have three elements involved. You've got to believe it. You've got to say it. And you've got to act on it like it's really true. If you say it and, and you say, I believe it, and you keep saying it, but you never act like it's true, then you're not walking in faith and you'll never walk into your victory. You'll never walk into it. You'll never walk into it. They say faith and patience are twin. They're dual forces. Well, what does one do? Are they the same? No. Both of them have a different job description. When I say in the name of Jesus, I command this mountain, according to Mark 11, 11 23, whosoever say in this mountain, be thou removed. Say, say, say. Be removed, be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Not your head, your head will say it's not gonna work, but it's in here, you believe, faith is of the heart. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. Those things which he says, 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 shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says, says, says. For what things serve you desire when you pray, believe, believe, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. When do, when do you believe you receive? When you pray, not when you see. These are things we have gone over from the beginning. So when I say I believe, I command the mountain to be removed, at that point in time, words are activated. Word goes into manifestation, I believe. And uh, I believe at that point in time, the heavens open, heaven helps available. And the promise or the things that God said that was coming my way is going to come through that heavenly portal into my life, into my life. The enemy says, okay. He actually believes it. He says it. Well, let's just see how patient he is. So now the enemy starts messing with you, not God. God's not the author of your, God's the author of your salvation, not the author of your damnation. You need to get it in there. He's not the one who's causing your problem. He's the one who's bringing you out of your problem. If somewhere you pin God to be your problem, you're already in the wrong race. He's the author of your salvation, not your damnation. 
So here is the thing about patience. So when I say, I believe in the name of Jesus, I command the mountain to be removed. I command it to be cast into the sea. I won't doubt in my heart, regardless of what my head says. My heart believes that the things I say shall come to pass and I have whatever I say. I executed the laws of faith and I believe. Now, when that, at that point in time, your faith will be tested. It's not God testing your faith. Your faith will be tested. Your resolve will be tested. But the thing that's going to bring you out is patience. It's patience. Your faith? No. Your faith opened the door. What's going to bring you out? Patience. You have got to have a resolve of patience. Patience is another part of that twin. My faith man rises up inside and says, I believe I receive. Well, patience says, I'll be there to make sure it happens. So when that, if there is a door back here, those double doors, got two doors that swings, faith opens both of those doors. Patience stands in that doorway with both feet and both arms and says, you're not closing until the promise comes through. You're not closing until the manifestation shows up. It's not going to happen. I don't care what you say. Patience is going to have its perfect work. Not a part-time work. Patience is going to have its perfect work. It's not going to close. So the enemy has got to get patience out of that doorway. He already knows you already sat on faith, but your patience has beat you. Patience has been laid off. Patience has been sent home. We're going to let faith do all the work. It didn't say through faith you inherit it. It said through faith and patience. So what happens now? A day later, it's not there. Well, I thought God was going to do it today. Well, I thought God really healed me. When I went there, the elders anointed me with oil. We prayed. I believed the promise, which was not just a promise. I believed Jesus is really my healer. I believed that when I walked away from there that I was healed. But, oh, but there it is again. I guess I didn't get it. What if we start acting like the Bible is true? Just for kicks and giggles. What if we just act like it's really true? Because patience is is being consistent, constantly the same. That means it doesn't matter what goes on, what I hear, what I see, what goes on. Patience is the key to keep that door open because I believe I received it. So there's no sense the door to close. I, I, I believe I receive it. But see, a lot of, a lot, a lot of you, the reason why you haven't, the manifestation's not upon you, because you've let the door close and you don't know what's closed because you have pulled back from patience. You've let patience off the job. I just don't know why. I just don't know why. They get it. I don't know why I get it. So the enemy starts m- messing with you and you get into strife with somebody else. The Bible says your, wep- your, your warfare is not against flesh and blood. So now the enemy gets you focused up on someone else, gets you focused in some kind of a strife issue. And now faith is struggling to stay active and patience has already packed his bags and headed home because you've already walked out of that. And we wonder, I don't understand why it's taking so long to get the answer. Folks, these things don't have to take so long to get the answer. Faith opens the door to the supernatural. Patience keeps it open until the evidence shows up in your life. It's just as much yours when you say it as it is when you see it on your body or see it in your pocket or see it in your house. Whatever it is, it's there. So you've got to persevere. You've got to be persistent. You got to allow patience to have his perfect work. But if you keep making excuses for your life, you're not going to live on top. You have moments of victory, but you're not going to live in total victory. You have moments of victory, but you're not going to live in total victory. But you've got to, you got to live in total victory. And regardless of how much the church world or, or how much the world wants people to think that it's, it's all right to, to live in sin, it's not right. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It's not right. 
It's not right. Black is black and white is white and hell is hot and sin ain't right. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You can color whatever color you want. But heaven's going to be rightfully judging when we get there. So you've got to learn how to push, press through these obstacles. You got to learn how to push and press through these obstacles. Shannon did a book in his small group called The World's Gone Crazy. I believe it. I just understand why some Christians are. The world's gone crazy. No sense for the church to go crazy. The book didn't say the church gone crazy. It said the world's gone crazy. In no sense you following it. Amen. You are the light. You're salt. We've been talking about that. But this morning at 8.15, I got in here about 8.17, praying. God immediately began to deal with my heart about people falling prey to pressures. This is not a sermon I got at 9.30. This is not a sermon I got at 10.30. This is at this morning about people falling prey to pressures. You got to stand strong under pressure. You got to stand strong under pressure. You got to stand strong under pressure. Paul said, I've been pressured on every side. I've been pressured on every side. Yet, I have not succumbed to this pressure. You, you can read it. Here's the thing Paul said. He said, you think you got it rough? I've been stoned and left for dead. I've been in fastings, not because I wanted to. I've been in perils of the sea. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beat by the Jews over and over again. I've had my own countrymen come against me. All of these things has come up on my life, but then he made one of the most powerful statements. On top of all of that, the cares of the church are upon me daily. The cares of the church is upon me daily. It's not like all this other stuff isn't enough. The cares of the church are upon me daily. And so when you look at this, but you've got to press through and then you receive the power to overcome because you've got to press through this. You've got to press through it. You've got to press through. There's times where uh, I, I just had to press through. I have, I've literally had to press through. That means I had to believe it on purpose. I had to say it and believe it on purpose. I had to say it and believe it on purpose. I had to say it and believe it on purpose. Say it and believe it on purpose. This is why I was able to say it so fluently in my eyes and my ears, in my mouth and my heart. The word of God's in my eyes and my ears, in my mouth and my heart. How can you say it so fast? Because I said it for hours and days and months because I had to believe it, believe it, and believe it on purpose. Because the enemy is not going to win. You've got to get it inside of you. You've got to get resolve in you that I don't lose. I'm a winner. Amen. The only way I lose is if I declare myself a loser. Well, how do I declare myself a loser? Not forgiven, getting in strife. Walking in issue unity, walking in un unforgiveness that I just said, you know, not in the not forgiving part. Allowing your flesh to have its way. That's how you lose. But the enemy don't have power to beat you. No. Jesus already defeated him on your part. He, you don't even belong to him. There's times I've messed up and I, and I have, in the middle of repenting, it's almost like a spirit's here. Yeah, but you've blown it too many times. You're blown. That wouldn't come from God. You've blown it too many times. You've blown it too many times. I've said out loud, it's none of your business how many times I've blown it. I've said out loud, it's none of your business how many times I've blown it. It's between me and God. And I turned away. It's between me and God. I do it as a, as a symbol. And I realize I turn away. There's not a physical person there. But it's like I'm praying. I, I just turn off and say, it's none of your business how many times I've blown it. It's between me and God, I thank you that you're my forgiver, that you're the one who cleanses me. No, you got to persevere this thing. You, you, you got to press. 
You gotta press. You gotta push through the muck. You gotta push through the struggles. You gotta push through the mental warfare to get to the other side. Nowhere did it say it was ever gonna be easy. But it does say it's gonna be rewarding. See, we, see we, 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 I think, not say we, I try not to ever do it. When somebody gets saved, you made the best decision in your life. That's a fact. I tell them that. You know, the battle is over. You won. No, the battle's just starting. The battle's just starting. For us to tell newborn Christians that, uh, that, that uh, it's easy, no, no, it's rewarding. It's rewarding. It's rewarding. I see people been saved for 25, 30 years that still can't beat it. So if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But it's rewarding. It is rewarding. Rewarding. There is a thing of consecration in our life where we have to examine. Consecration is what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed with the pressures on him. And he says, not my will, but your will be done. The prayer of consecration is simple. It's simply declaring yourself or releasing yourself into the total will of God that you're not going to be your own person. You're not going to be your own God. You're not going to govern your own life. You're going to allow him to govern your own life. So I knew when service started, I told Angel, I said, I'm going to mix it up today. When, they, when Jeff prayed, I'm coming up. I'm getting that out of the way because I don't want that clock to hinder me of sharing what's in my heart. Amen. And that is, as a secular movie said, if you're going to be somebody and if you're going to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. The day is dark. The time is short. And it's time to persevere. It's time to be persistent. It's time to have patience. It's time to push. And then you'll walk in all the power you need to live life victorious. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. When Angel first met me, <clears throat> uh, not when she first met me, but during the time we started dating, we met in, I think, the fall of 95 the fall of 95 is when we met. She was sitting back over there where Sister Johnson and them were sitting right now. And I was on the platform. And she came in with the Pottingers. And I looked over there and I said, I don't know who that is. But God sure took his time when he made that one. <laughs> That's what I said to myself. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I watched her worship God. That's what attracted me. But I said, God sure took his time when he made that one. I didn't know what that one was all about. I just, from the outward, and uh, didn't even talk to her that night. But I had four people come up and said, her name is Angel. What are you talking about? That girl said, her name was Angel. <laughs> yeah, they did. Come up, your name was Angel. So then I found out what her name was. <clears throat> but I didn't even talk to her that night. But anyway, it was that, it was that um, uh, we got married in 97. So 96, uh, I was in Kenya when God really dealt with me about, you know, leaving the, the realm of construction and everything else I was doing and do this thing full time. And so right after that, that was, that was in, uh, you know, I think it was, it was early in 96. I landed in Kenya like February 27th, 1996, and I got home May 2nd. So that was a pretty good extent of being in Kenya. And during that time was when God really pressed on my heart what I was going to do. And at that point in time, it was so severe in my life that I knew if I didn't obey God this time, I didn't know how much time I'd have left. And I've made that statement here many times. I told Angel, if I disobey God now, I don't know if I ever lived to be an old man. <clears throat> now to be an old man, I don't know how old that is, 
because some of you people here have aged, but you don't know what old is either. So since we have no reference point of what it is to be old, I don't know what that is yet. Even talking to Tom Haynes at 96, he passed away at 100 years old, somewhere between 100 and 101. And when he was 96, he went to Africa with me the last time. And he said, I better go before I get too old. So if you ask him, 96 wasn't old yet. So, you know, it depends on which, on how you look at it. But right after that, I went through one of the hardest times in my life, not just the money part, a betrayal. A betrayal with a fellow minister that I loved, loved and respected and honored. Which happened about August of that year. And for one year, I cried. I couldn't get it off of me. I cried for one year. Matter of fact, the only time since 1994, the only time I never was in Kenya was 1997. Never went to Kenya one time in 97. Never, never, never traveled in 1997. Didn't, didn't go. I was so heartbroken. I've made up for it since then. I figured up till the day over 50 some trips I've been there. I was heartbroken. I didn't go in 97. I went to other places, but I, I didn't go to Kenya. I went back in 98. They had elections going on that wasn't going, it wasn't going right, so I justified it as elections. It wasn't safe to go. But my heart, I was broke. I was heartbroken. Every day I got up and thinking, everything you've worked for over the last two and a half, three years is gone. You'll never, there's nothing there for you anymore. There's nothing there for you anymore. Uh, I wasn't going to be able to go back where I was at. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. I felt like I lost everything. And I remember Angel asked me, she said, how long are you going to continue to cry? How long are you going to continue to cry over this? I'm thinking, as long as I want to. <laughs> huh? It's my party. It's my, <laughs> this is my sorrow party. I'll cry as long as I want. And for one year, I cried. I was hurt. The warfare was so intense. It wasn't just heartbroken. The warfare was intense. I'm talking intense intense it wasn't like anything I've ever been through it was intense the spiritual part of it was intense and I remember after she said that I knew how long am I going to sit here how long am I going to cry over this am I going to yield the call of God and the anointing of God to this situation am I going to let the first real obstacle that I run into going to eliminate what I know I'm called to do? Am I going to allow the first real challenge other than these low-level devil things? Am I going to allow the first real challenge when I've preached higher levels, bigger devils? And if I'm going to allow this little low-level, you know, this, this situation here to keep me out of this, is this what I'm going to do? And I got out of it. I got out of it. Went back in 98, started working with Appendi, and then I met Shatika and got over to Kakamega and uh, was, was there until we're still friends. We're still together. So with all of that, you got to persevere. I mean, it's all right to have a pity party as long as you don't stay in the party. So you had to help someone. You got to help people. You got to allow people to help you. So Angel comes along and says, how long, how long are you going to keep crying over this? It's, I mean, betrayals are real. There's not a person in here who hasn't been betrayed. But you got to know how to survive that and live in victory. You got to know how to survive, the, survive every betrayal and live in victory. Say perseverance. perseverance. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to push. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow the enemy to beat me out of what God has for me. If you really believe that God's got great things in store for your future, then why would you keep yourself from getting there? If you really believe God's got great things in store for you, why would you keep yourself from getting there? Now the thing in the bulletin, to, to evaluate yourself, folks, <clears throat> you, 
this consistent life, you, you can't just you, you can't just be up, you can't just be up and down, up and down. You gotta be consistent. You, you, you gotta be consistent in everything that you do. You gotta be consistent. Now, I know some people are sitting there thinking, yeah, he's just talking, he, he, he just dealing with me direct. No, I'm not dealing with you direct. I'm dealing with what God dealt with my heart this morning in prayer, and that's what I'm obligated for. So, so don't even allow the enemy to get on you and thinking, well, it's just you he's talking to. No, if it was just you, it'd be a whole lot easier just come to you and preach the notes I brought in here about dealing with uh, the fruit of the harvest. So it's not just dealing with just you. I'm dealing with the body. I'm dealing with things in the spirit. I'm, letting, I'm, I'm calling heaven and earth to record this day of what's going on, that we refuse to quit. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of everything else going on, we refuse to yield. And we stay strong. That's what I call the record. And we stay strong. Amen. We stay strong. But don't allow the enemy to sift you. Don't allow the enemy to sift you. You stay strong. Amen. You stay strong. Don't pull back. Press in. Press in. And just because things don't go your way, quit pouting. I don't know how else to say it. Just because things don't go your way, quit pouting. Just live right. Live strong. Live victorious. Some of you will never know what it is to live victorious until you decide, I'm going to get outside of me and get into him. I'm going to step outside of me. We tell people all the time, are you outside of your mind? Well, sometimes you got to get outside of your mind and get into his mind. You got to get outside of yourself. And you got to decide this thing is not about me. What's our call, Pastor? Our call is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, all of our strength, and love our neighbors ourselves. And then find out what the true mandate is here that we're trying to get across to you and say, this is, this is what I'm going to do to make it come to pass. If this is where God sent me, then my responsibility is to see this thing come to pass. It's not just to say amen. Amen means so, so be it. Let it be done. And that's where it's at. So then you got to overcome. You got to overcome. So let's, let me close this pastoral session out in Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 verse 31 just like we started 31 in the last place What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us, how many things? Yes, all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now, have you ever had anybody bring a charge against you? Yes, we have. People said things is not true. Who shall bring a charge to God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us? What shall separate us? What event, what person, what situation, what disappointment is going to be able to separate us from this? Shall tribulation, shall distresses, persecutions, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword? It is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yea, in all these things we were more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
We, we are, we are, we were, we are, and we will be. Everything he did, he did it before you were even born. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. I am persuaded. I want to add a word in there. I'm going to put fully. And you ought to be able to add that word. I am fully persuaded. I am persuaded fully. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Things present or things to come. Things present or things to come. Things present or things to come. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature or created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What's going to separate us? Nothing. Now, there's two places, there's two ways I'm going to look at this. Not separate you from Christ, but we should allow nothing to separate us from one another who are in Christ. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing shall separate us. I realize it's a one-on-one thing. Nothing's going to separate me. But I think we ought to take a step further. Nothing's going to separate us. Divided, we fall. United, we stand. Oh, yes. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. He's talking to, to the Romans there. Nothing, he, he mentioned them. Nothing's going to separate us, you know, them together. But we shouldn't allow anything to separate us. We should have such a common goal and unity one with another in the things of God and, and be persistent and persevere and, and push through and, and walk in patience that, that, we, that we not just talk strength, we are strength. We, not, we don't just talk power, we are power. We don't just talk good, we are good because he's good to us. And he's made a way for us to live victorious all the days of our life. So you got a decision to make today. Are you going to persevere? Are you going to press through the pressures? Are you going to walk in patience? These are things that you've got to you, you got to decide. You can't decide on the run. You got to make a dedicated decision in the presence of God. You know, I realize some people say, well, my situation, I wouldn't even talk about your situation. I realize everybody's different size, shapes, and everything. You know, everybody is in shape. It depends on what shape that is. Okay? Uh, but I know what's healthy for me and what's not. And, you know, I have taken off some weight. And I've done it in a healthy fashion, first time, probably. But here's my thing. I was where I wanted to be, and I got careless. My old addiction started coming back. Ice cream, donuts, Donuts, bread, donuts, ice cream, hostess cupcakes. Anybody feel my pain? And, uh, and I went to 195. I said, you know, I ought to ease up here. 200, 205, 210. You know, I should, I'm going to start Monday. I started, a couple years ago, I started dieting 52 times, Mondays, 52 of them in a year, 52 of them, and I failed all 52 times, 215, 220, 225, lethargic, taking a deep breath to tie my shoes, and someone says, you want to go get ice cream? Right behind you. I'll start Monday. That's all I said. I'll start Monday. I, 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 I could not 
I could not get my mind wrapped around it. I say that not to bring light laughter, which it's always good to have some, I guess. I say that is, uh, I never made a decision of quality. The Bears came up to me one day. They lived close to Bill's Donuts then. Now they live here, close to us here. But they lived close to Bill's Donuts before they built our house here. And they uh, first brought me, I, I partook of those cream horns from Bill's Donuts. And they were some kind of special. And, uh, and so they kept hearing me say, I'm going to change my habits. So they asked me one day, uh, are you ready for some donuts or something or whatever? Are, are, you, are you dieting? I said, yeah, but I don't think I'm totally committed yet. I don't think I'm totally committed yet. I've proclaimed it, but I haven't been totally committed. So what I proclaimed is one thing. What I got committed to is the next. That's like you get up in the morning, you're casual. I think I'll fast today. You eat three of the biggest meals of your life, plus snacks in between. Because the enemy will mess with you. Look at that. Nobody's asked you to go to Texas Roadhouse for a month. Now you decide you're going to fast today and you got two calls. And so because you, did, you made a casual commitment, you find yourself, before they even bring the onion, already got three rolls down. <laughs> no, you got to make a decision of quality before you get there. You got to make a decision of quality, decision of quality before you get the call. You got to make decision of quality before the donut shows up. You got to make decision of quality before it happens. You got to make a decision of quality before it goes on. Because if you don't make a decision of quality, you won't be able to stand in it. So I'm asking you today, in an atmosphere with no pressure, make a decision of quality today. So when pressure hits when you leave here, and it will happen, immediately the thief comes. Immediately the thief will come. You make a decision of quality today. So when the thief starts to come, you're not going to pull back. I have consecrated myself and I've made a quality decision that this is how I'm going to live. Not until the next problem, but until the trumpet blows. This is how I'm going to live. Amen. All right, let's stand together.